Philip Davis, thank you very much uh, for being on Vesting People. Um, now, you're well known as an MP who loves horse racing and has indeed been a bookmaker themselves before. Um, tell us actually about how you got into bookmaking and racing. Well, it was my family, really. Um, my, when I was growing up, my mum had a, her own betting office in Doncaster, Marilyn Davis Bookmakers. I think she was probably one of the first women to have a licensed bookmaker's pre uh, premises. Um, and so it was a family thing, really. All, all the years I was growing up, it was sort of compulsory to be interested in horse racing. Uh, my granddads, both of them, were very keen on horse racing. My, uh, my dad's dad used to own horses with Jack Berry. Um, when Jack Berry started training as a struggling national hunt trainer in Doncaster before he became very successful in Lancashire training on the on the on the flat so it, it's a family thing really everyone in the family is interested in horse racing um, because of the betting shop it was pretty much compulsory um, and you know all my family are into horse racing my my, uh, my nephew James works for Timeform now so it's a uh, it's cascaded through the generations mm. Um, what did you learn about betting in punters from your mother specifically? Uh, what characters they are. I mean, if you really want to meet some characters, go into a betting shop. You meet an absolute salt of the earth people in, in, a, in a betting shop. Um, and so, you know, I spent time there probably before I was the, the age of 18, to be perfectly honest, mm. as well. And um, the thing that I remember from working in my mum's shop was just the great characters who, who came in. Who, who, you know, I can recall them now. And I think, you know, that's something that people don't understand, actually, is that how people in betting shops, they really understand their punters. They, they know them really well, you know, and, and I think people underappreciate how well people in a betting shop know the punters who come in day in, day out. But the thing, you know, I just remember some real characters uh, coming into the, into the shop and, um, you know, salt, salt of the earth people. Um, and how come you didn't end up... Um following in her footsteps and being a British for life. It seems like you'd be a natural at it. I would have loved it. I'm sure I would have loved it. Um, the thing was, my mum didn't really enjoy it as much as I did. Um, it, when my mum started, it was actually my dad's idea, really. And my dad was a teacher and my mum was a civil servant. And um, the idea was that, you know, my mum would set it up and get it going. And as soon as it was established, my dad would quit teaching and become a become the bookmaker and my mum would go back into the civil service and sort of 25 years on my dad was still teaching and my mum was still running the betting shop and I, my mum loved the customers but I'm not sure she, she had the right uh, temperament for being a bookmaker she's quite risk averse really and so you know if there were big liabilities running onto a, a horse you know I don't really think that it was really for her um, and uh, and so she sold that she sold it really before I had a chance to take it on. Um, would I have taken it on? I don't know. I don't know if I would or not. I, I, but I loved I loved my time in the betting shop. I loved every minute of it. Um, but the the fact was the decision was taken out of my hand. She 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 sold the shop to, to a, a firm in the Midlands called Mark Jarvis. Um, so from then, uh, you know, you end up as an MP now. How did you end up getting into politics? Well, apart from it being compulsory to be interested in horse racing when I was growing up, it was also compulsory to be interested in politics. They were the two things that were, that were insisted upon, really, in our household. Um, my mum and dad were both involved in the local Conservative Association in Doncaster, uh, where I was born and brought up. And at the time, there weren't many Conservatives in Doncaster. So as soon as I was old enough to knock on doors and deliver leaflets at elections, my dad had me out knocking on doors and delivering leaflets. And, you know, I used to love election time. We never used to win any, but I used to love elections. Um, and so I was always interested in politics. And it was really Mrs Thatcher that really sparked my interest in politics. The first thing I can recall is the Falklands War. Uh, and I was 10 years old and I used to rush home from school to put the news on to see what happened in the Falklands War. Um, and through that I built up a, an admiration for, for Mrs Thatcher. And of course the other big thing at the time in my area was the miners' strike. Uh, our betting shop at the time was in a mining village and the miners' strike was a massive political issue for the country, but particularly in, a, in mining areas where, where I was. And so, you know, you were either on Mrs Thatcher's side or you're on Arthur Scargill's side and I was very much on Mrs Thatcher's side. And so I guess those two events really sparked my own personal interest in it. But Frankly, I was I was brought up to be interested in politics by my by my parents. 
And uh, from that early age, um, had you always wanted to end up as an MP or, or was it something you sort of found by chance? Because you're in the Conservative Association really young, mum and dad into it. So have we got quite a few of our MPs? Did you always think um, a Philip Davis MP is something you want to be in the future? No, not really. I mean, if you speak to people who were at school with me, they will all say, oh, we knew he was going to become an MP. Mm. But really what they mean is I was really interested in politics. That's really what they mean. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't ever envisage that I would become an MP. Um, and, you know, I, I was working for ASDA at the time. Um, and really I got, it, it was in the, in the late 1990s, I got really disillusioned with politicians. Nobody, nobody ever seemed to say anything that I wanted to be said. And so I thought, you know, rather than going down to the pub on a Friday night and complaining about it, I should try and do something about it. And so I applied to get on the approved list of Conservative candidates. And uh, I was very lucky because Archie Norman uh, was was the chairman of ASDA at the time, and he was uh, he was he was the uh, the MP for Tunbridge Wells. And you had to have an MP to uh, sign your nomination papers to get on the approved list. So Archie was my referee to get on the approved list. So I was very lucky in that regard. And um, I didn't actually ever think they'd want me, but I thought that I'd give it my best shot and at least, even if I didn't get anywhere, at least I'd given it a go. You know, I'd tried to make a difference. And I just kept getting through each stage of the process, much to, much to my surprise, really. So, no, I didn't, I didn't um, envisage I'd become an MP, but, uh, it, but certainly if you speak to my school friends, they'd envisaged it for me. Um, now, obviously, growing up, um, you know, working for a bookmaker in the family, um, your interest in betting has gone back a long way. Um, can you remember the first bet you had? Gosh, no, I can't remember the first bet I had actually, but I used to go to the races with my granddad from about regularly, from about the age of 13 onwards. Uh, from about 1985 onwards, he used to go, he was a butcher, my, and my granddad, and, and he'd had a butcher shop, but he'd sold it but he still worked there part-time, twice a week, doing the deliveries and things. And um, so, but the rest of the week, he used to go to the racing in Yorkshire, and he used to have this badge called the Go Racing in Yorkshire badge, it still exists. Yes. Uh, and he used to have that, and he used to go to every meeting in Yorkshire, um, where there was, and there's virtually every day there was a meeting on. So every Saturday, during the school holidays, you know, I'd tag along with my granddad and his friend, uh, who, and, and, uh, and so, I can't remember my first bet, but it would have been when I was about 13 at the races and my uh, my granddad would have no doubt put the bet on for me. Um, what um, are some of your, you know, that was a great era um, in racing, that's a time you growing up and you mentioned of course Jack Berry and Ward Progress, do you have any heroes in racing from that period? My favourite horse from that, the sort of mid 80s was Dancing Brave. I absolutely love Dancing Brave. Um, how, how he didn't win the Derby, I will never know. I don't think anybody will ever know, actually. Greville Starkey might know, but no one else will, <laughs> will know. Uh, but yeah, Dancing Brave was a real, a real hero of mine um, in, the, in the 1980s. And in the late 80s, horses like um, Nashwan and, and in the in 1990s, the Salsa Bill, they were, they, were, they were horses on the flat that I really really loved and over jumps i was a massive fan of the dickinsons being from yorkshire i was a big fan of the of the dickinsons and you know some of their uh, old-fashioned chasers silver buck and wayward lad and right hand man absolutely fantastic um i used to I used to love going to weatherby particularly when i was a kid that was my favorite race course um and basically the dickinsons arthur stevenson and uh, Mick and Peter Easterby used to farm all the races at Weatherby. I mean, they used to virtually train every winner there. Um, so yeah, they were some real, you know, they were some of my, my favorite horses at the time. And have you had the pleasure of meeting any of um, those Yorkshire legends, um, the Easterbys and the like? Yeah, actually, um, when, uh, when I first got into racehorse ownership with some colleagues at Asda and my dad, um, we actually had a, a, a horse trained by Mick Easterby um, and actually we've had lots of horses trained by, by Mick and, and point to pointers with David beforehand um, and I mean you know Mick is an absolute legend he's an absolute legend he's, he's brilliant he's you know one of the shrewdest people you can meet 
but you know the entertainment value is just absolutely terrific so yeah meeting uh, meeting Mick and having horses with Mick has, has been uh, absolutely fantastic because he is one of the all-time greats in the training ranks in my opinion. Um, when you first went into Parliament um, did you find that many of your peers um, were into racing or was it a subject that was talked about in Westminster did you find it easy to meet other racing fans? No not really that's that has actually surprised me that it's amazing how few racing fans there are in in parliament actually there's a few and obviously there's mps who have race courses or you know training centers or things in their constituency but th there aren't actually that many mps who are particularly interested in in horse racing or betting or understand betting or understand horse racing um which is one of the problems that the that the gambling industry has and the horse racing industry have that actually they don't have that many people in parliament who actually care about it that much. Um, and do you feel that the sports, you know, the sport has, some people say, a perception problem um, amongst the wider public and when it comes to some areas, and we're gonna get into that a bit later. Is there anything that you think racing uh, can do um, to improve its standing with MPs? Because there are some who might be more opposed to it. And in the same way, there are some MPs who have become vocally more anti-gambling. Um, and we'll discuss that a bit more later and the forms that takes, but do, what do you think the best way to show off racing um, and it is in Parliament? The best thing to, about for racing is for people to go to the races. I don't know anybody, frankly, who goes to the, a day at the races who doesn't enjoy it. Um, and the, you know that's what the racing industry has to do more of in terms of getting support amongst politicians is get as many MPs as possible for a day out at the races in their local area or close to Parliament wherever it is because you know it's infectious it, you know horse racing is a fantastic day out um, fantastic fun I, I say I don't know anybody who's gone to the, spent a day at the races and not enjoyed it and I think that's the secret to it you know unless you're really into it people aren't necessarily going to watch it on the telly you know but the, but if they go they're gonna love it and i think uh, you know get as many mps to the races as possible and uh sort of lastly to end uh, this this section of the interview um one of the things i think that's coming up around the uh, horizon is you know not just a, a gambling review but i think also as part of it um restrictions on or more measures to combat uh, problem gambling, harmful gambling, people become addicted. Uh, is there any particular area um, that you think the gambling review should be focusing on, um, considering the amount of issues that are being talked about in the industry at the moment? It's got to find a balance between protecting people who are susceptible to harm, but also allowing people the freedom to pursue their interests and the freedom to spend their own money as they see fit. At the end of the day, you know, people have earned the money, they should be able to spend it as they see fit and it shouldn't be for the government to tell them how much you can spend on X or how much you can spend on Y or how much you can spend on Z. So the government's got a difficult balance to try and to, to sort out those two competing issues. Um, I, I fear it's going to go too far on the restricting everybody in order to help a very small proportion of people who have an addiction and i hope it doesn't go down that route what we should do is say to people who haven't got a problem you know you crack on and spend your money as you see fit let's focus our efforts on the very small proportion of people who have a have an addiction to try and stop them getting there to try and help them when they do get there to support their families because obviously it's terrible for the families as well when somebody has an addiction well, let's focus our efforts on the people who have a problem rather than just pursue measures which affect everybody in order to try and hit a few people who have a, a problem. So um, I hope the government will, will see its way to find that balance. I fear it may not, um, but it's really, really important that we, you know, I don't believe in the nanny state. I don't, I'm a libertarian. You know, that's my political philosophy. I believe people should be free to pursue whatever lawful activity they, they want. And I just hope that the government don't throw the baby out with the bathwater 
um, and they make sure that we look after people who need protecting but let everyone else crack on and enjoy themselves and spend their own money as they see fit. Thank you very much um, for this part of the Better People interview, Philip Davis. Thank you.